Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Michael Siggins, and I'm the publisher of Channel Pro. Today's topic for our webinar is how to build recurring revenue around endpoint protection and backup. And we're going to begin in just a moment. We're actually opening up our virtual doors and letting folks file in. So again, you're in the right place for endpoint protection plus backup and how it equals recurring revenue and profits. Just come on in, sit tight, and we're going to get going in just a moment. All right, well, I'm back again. Again, this is Michael Siggins. I'm the publisher of Channel Pro. Channel Pro produces a website, events, and a monthly magazine for managed service providers and IT integrators. Our mission is to provide you with the information, e insights, and resources that you need to run a more successful business. Today's webinar is a perfect example of that kind of info to help you in your business. How to bundle recurring revenue around endpoint protection and backup is what we're going to cover today. The webinar is presented by our friends at Carbonite, and we have very special guests today. Leading us off today will be Carl Palachuk, IT and managed services author, coach, and consultant, and a longtime Channel Pro contributor. Carl, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. And also Jonathan Farrick, product manager from Carbonite. All right, so a few quick housekeeping things before we get going. Please get involved. We always encourage your feedback and questions. It makes for a better experience for everybody today. Audience members may ask questions via the Q&A module at the bottom of the screen. We will follow up after the webinar with additional information and a link to the recording and the slide decks. All right, now I'm going to turn things over to our presenters. We're going to kick things off with Carl Palachuk and then turn things over to Jonathan Farrick with Carbonate. Carl, please take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I have built and sold a couple of managed service businesses in Sacramento, California. And I currently spend my time writing books and <laughs> training IT consultants to be better at the business part of their business. So I would appreciate it if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or any of the social media. Uh, I would appreciate that. So part of what we have to look at today is, you know, what I consider to be the single most important thing we do, which is not the backup, but testing the backup. I mean, that's, to me, when I look at what people do in this industry, if you did nothing else for your clients but test their backups, that's where the majority of your value would come from. Uh, more and more, we see people who, as they move stuff to the cloud, can't figure out where everything is. And we're beginning to hear horror stories of people who have lost their data because they, they moved it somewhere and now that IT person's gone, nobody knows where it is, don't have the password. I mean, it's, it's becoming a real problem and it's even a worse problem when you add human beings to the mix. So, you know, we, it's one thing to say, oh, we have data and it's here and it lives in a server in the closet. Okay, that's great. But that was 1996, right? So today we're, we have a much more complex environment and we have to be very, very careful. And I've had coaching clients who call, come to me and say, well, you know, we had a problem with the client's hard drive and we went to restore the backup and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is that nobody had tested it. They set it up and they just assumed it was working forever. And so that's why I say, you know, we, you want to say the backup's the important thing, but in reality, it's testing the backups that's the most important thing. So, um, you know, you've all seen the stats about you know, different problems that happen when people lose their data. And I just had a phone call over the weekend from a friend that his wife accidentally deleted a PST file. And then he, not knowing she had done that, came in and emptied the deleted items folder. And then that's when he discovered his backup wasn't working, right? So those kinds of things are where the problems are. Right? And he was literally in a panic. This is her entire business. This is all of her email for the last 20 years, you know, that kind of thing. Um, when people lose that kind of data and don't recover it, it, is, it truly is the end of their business. And so that's why this is such a critically important thing. And let me just give you a quick intro to my background. So in the 1990s, I ran a HP 3000 shop. Uh, I was kind of, people call them mainframes, but it was really a mini back in the day. Uh, had a two-state operation in California, New York. We backed up to each other and on a series of 
58 reel-to-reel tapes every night. Uh, then I got a uh, consulting gig at HP's Roseville plant in California, where I was in charge of the backup systems for the Roseville plant. So that meant backing up all of the servers from one building to another every night, and we used tape backup DAT 72s. We literally had thousands of them and had a 365 day rotation. So if a tape was used once, it didn't go back into use for a year. And so, you know, testing those backups was absolutely critical. Um, a lot of people in the 2000s said, oh, you know, tape sucks and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that um, it was the SCSI that was the problem. Technicians didn't understand it well enough. And so a lot of technicians couldn't set up those backup systems properly. And, you know, now we do like disk to disk to cloud, right? And we're much, much more focused on imaging rather than individual files. But still, somebody has to test that stuff. And, you know, what's one of the things where you can automate almost anything in your business, patch management, antivirus, uh, updates, all kinds of stuff, but you can't automate having somebody actually test the backup. And the reason for that is that you need your technicians to be able to do this. They have to be able to uh, actually go through the backup and recovery process. Historically, what I found with new clients and prospects over the last 25 years is that about 50% of them have no working backup when they, when they first meet me. They might think they have a backup, but it hasn't been tested in years. And so they keep switching disks or whatever, and they just believe it's working and, and they never test it. Um, and so, you know, part of why you need to go through the recovery process every month is to demonstrate that you can actually get data off of the cloud or off of the disk or whatever it might be. And, and that's where having good systems that make sense to people is huge. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of people do is they create complicated systems when they don't need to. And that's where, you know, modern technology, you know, can save your neck, you know, in case of an emergency. Um, in terms of, you know, what we do monthly um, is we make sure that we rotate all of our technicians through all of our clients. And the reason that I like to do that is that um, all of the technicians learn all of the different client systems. They learn the backup system very well. And that way, the first time that they see a, re a restore process is not in an emergency. They see it month after month at all of the clients. And so when it's time to do data recovery, there's no chance that they're gonna mess it up or there's less chance that they're gonna mess it up because they've seen it before and they know what they're looking at. You know, it's almost like you think about sports teams that have gone to the playoffs, right? Teams that have gone there a number of times are a lot less nervous because they know what to expect. Uh, your technicians are going to be a lot less nervous if they know what to expect. Um, it's also the case that you are limiting the size of your company if you limit the number of people who understand uh, the backup systems well enough to actually be sent out to restore data when necessary. So, uh, you know, if you buy good hardware today, chances are it's not going to fail, right? If you buy business class hardware and it's under warranty, chances that it's going to fail in the first three years are very, very, very slim. Uh, but what does fail is people, <laughs> right? People delete their own PST. People uh, click on stuff they shouldn't. And, uh, you know, they click on the button that says, yes, please in infest me with ransomware. Uh, and every time I watch the news and I hear about a city or a company that has lost all their data and is spending millions of dollars, you know, paying ransoms, all I can think of is they didn't have an appropriate backup system. They literally, they had nothing. Uh, or whatever they had, they didn't know how to use it. 
So, you know, every single time you hear a story like that, it's an opportunity for you to go to your clients and say, do not let this happen to you. Yes, it costs something, but it doesn't cost that much. And it's a lot less expensive than losing all of your data because somebody either accidentally deleted something or uh, they clicked on something and encrypted the entire uh, hard drive that everybody shares. So when we test backups, we eliminate downtime and we allow your clients to continue to operate trouble free. Um, and that way, you know, when you take care of what they're doing, the way that you're going to build recurring revenue is you have to focus on getting into their office at least once a month. Yeah, I want you to do a monthly maintenance. You know, I'm really big on that. But it's also the case that the one thing that you can't eliminate with automated technology is actually testing the backups, uh, putting your hands on it and making that happen. And so it's it also turns out to be a very visible thing that you can do with your clients to go into their office, test that backup, um, you know, do a, do a or test restore. And again, you got to figure out what are you going to restore for each client? You have to make a list of exactly the kinds of things you want to restore. Make sure that you can restore something to each hard drive that's being backed up. Uh, if it's individual users endpoints, you want to make sure that you can restore to that endpoint or to an alternate location. Um, so as a rule, you're going to spend between half an hour and an hour doing a legitimate test of that backup. And that has value. That is something that you can sell as part of your recurring revenue. And it's something that the client sees month after month after month that they are not going to be on the six o'clock news. They are not going to have to worry about somebody clicking the wrong thing and putting them out of business. Uh, and you know, again, it, whether it's malicious behavior or just stupidity, clients break their own stuff all the time. And so, you know, you should be the one that they call on to say, hey, we need to get this back and you know, put a ticket in the system Eventually, you'll be able to do it all remotely, but the client doesn't see you if you're completely remote. So it's a good way for you to get into that office once a month, make a, a touch with your primary contact and make sure that they feel safe that, that you are actually taking care of their data. So, uh, you know, stress to your clients the importance of, you know, making sure that this this business continuity is a piece of what the value is. A lot of people today have problems um, expressing to their clients the value of the services that they provide since they are not seeing them on a regular basis with a lot of the remote work we do. This is a way that they can see you right away. Um, and so it gives you recurring revenue. Uh, it helps you with your finances. And you know, one of the things that you happen you have with recurring revenue is you have the ability to feel like your business is very robust and you have the opportunity to try new things and grow your business. Um, if you're scratching and clawing to make every dollar, it's really hard to take that extra time to actually go grow your business and figure out new ways uh, to bring value to your clients. So that's what I have for today. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I think we're going to hold questions till the end, um, but you know you can put them into the Q and A section now. Uh, but I encourage you to figure out a system that you can sell to every single client that gives you recurring revenue and allows you to focus on uh, making sure that their data is safe. Uh, you know, you can even have a marketing campaign that says you're not eligible to be on the six o'clock news because we're taking care of all of your data. <laughs> That's great. Carl's keys to growth. All right, Carl, thank you very, very much. Uh, and as Carl just mentioned, we, uh, Carl will be uh, relaxing uh, for the rest of the webinar today, but he will be around to field questions. So please do, there's a Q&A sort of section down at the kind of the center bottom of your browser window. Please feel free to send any questions to Carl now or uh, over the next 40 minutes or so. And uh, we're now gonna turn things over to Jonathan Ferrick. Jonathan, please take it away. All right. I just so, want to switch our screens. Yep, there we go. Okay. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Right. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Farrick. I'm a product manager here at Carbonite, uh, specifically focused on the Carbonite Endpoint product. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our offering. Um, but before I do that, I do just want to uh, reiterate, especially one of the big things that Carl mentioned, and that is testing backups. Um, obviously working for Carbonite, a uh, data backup and protection company, uh, I have seen many instances where people have been using products where they didn't set it up correctly or they simply just never went from the end-to-end -end process to verify things and have unfortunately um, run into those issues where you know they're in panic mode and now they're trying to restore for the first time and there are some products out there that don't necessarily have the you know the easiest uh, user experience where when someone is in a critical mindset like that that they can easily go through it so I do want to just stress how important it is to not only just test the restore functionality in general, but become familiar with it. So that if you do run into one of those situations where, you know, something's basically on fire and you're in, you know, go, go, go mode, that you can do it smoothly and confidently um, and ensure that you are able to get all that information back. So Carbonite Endpoint. Um, let's talk about a couple of the challenges with protecting endpoints. So over time, and especially, you know, more, more recent years, the mobile workforce is growing. There are more and more employees who are working remotely as opposed to in an office. And on their laptops is corporate data. And it's estimated that about 45% of business data is actually on devices that organizations can't control. So whether it's you know, your major concern or your client's concern, um, it is very important to have control and access of that information, which ties into the next one. It's also estimated that 72% of employees are using unauthorized free file sharing services. Now there's nothing necessarily wrong with using a file sharing service, but the problem really comes in is when they're using a file sharing service where they're keeping corporate information that ne doesn't necessarily belong to them, and whether it's you or the administrator of that organization doesn't have any access to that file sharing service because it's the user's personal service. So having a way to you know, lock files down or delete them is also fairly critical and something that um, organizations definitely need to make sure they're addressing. And then just in general, it's a very expensive process or you know, experience when a device is lost or stolen. So just having a way to keep those costs down from whether it's having to recreate data from scratch or pay some very expensive service to try to recover a, a broken hard drive, having something in place to make sure that process of getting everything back um, and being you know, confident and secure about it is very critical. So let's just talk about a little, a little bit about Carbonite Endpoint itself. Um, so this product uh, works on both Windows and Macs um, but can back up pretty much all the files with the, the exception of operating system files. And it backs up by default to our vaults. And for our vaults, we have a few different options. We have our Carbonite multi-tenant vaults that are, are hosted in Azure. And you, know, you can be deployed in one of our vaults and because they are multi-tenant, you will have complete segregation from any other users in the vault, and all of your clients will have complete segregation from one another as well. But you, as an administrator, would have the ability to manage all of the, you know, the accounts nested to your partner account. You, additionally, if you have your own infrastructure, you have your own data center, you have the ability to deploy an on-premise vault. Um, if you had your own Azure EA, for example, and didn't want to use one of the vaults within Carbonite's Azure account, you can also deploy a vault within your Azure EA account and pretty much any region that Azure supports, your vault can be deployed there. Um, regardless of how the vault is deployed, the experience is exactly the same from a management perspective as well as from the end user perspective. One of the biggest benefits of Carbonite Endpoint is our global deduplication. So this is a client side deduplication process where basically we are able to deduplicate on the end user's device as opposed to needing to send information up to the vault and then determine if we need it or not. Now the benefits of this is that one, it is going to drastically reduce the amount of bandwidth that is needed because we're not uploading unnecessary blocks. And two, because we're able to do it globally, there is drastic reduction in the amount of data that actually needs to be uploaded to the vault because we're able to see that we already have some of those individual blocks on our vaults. Um, and another big piece about this is that the security aspect because we have a patented algorithm where we're able to deduplicate on encrypted blocks. So the process is as we identify you know, changes in a file, we'll break those out into small little blocks. 
we will then encrypt those blocks. And on the encrypted blocks themselves, we're able to deduplicate across other files and uh, blocks that have already been backed up. And those, the encryption of the files themselves, um, it's pretty much how the files will remain until you actually need to restore it. So unless there's a request to pull those files down, they will always remain encrypted, making it very difficult for anyone to ever get access to them. We have a quick cache technology, which is an optional component where if you or maybe one of your clients has bandwidth restrictions or concerns, or maybe they're just in a location that doesn't necessarily have the fastest upload or download rates, uh, you can deploy a quick cache on premise, um, you know, on it, whether it's a server or a VM. But what this quick cache will do is it will act as the initial point for the devices to back up to. So as opposed to backing up directly to um, the Carbonite vault or to potentially one of your own vaults that you deploy on premise or within your own Azure, um, it will first back up to this quick cache and you then have control over the quick cache to determine when it's actually going to be uploading those backups to the vault itself. So because it's going over the local area network, it's going to be a lot faster than if you're going to actually be relying on the internet to upload them to the vault. Uh, again, this is an optional component, um, isn't really needed for everyone, but it's available. Uh, and additionally, you could set up multiple. So you don't necessarily have to only have one. Uh, if you had a client that wanted a quick cache for their marketing department because they had very large video files, for example, and then want another one for engineering, you can do that. One of the nice things about it is, even if someone is configured to back up to that quick cache, um, the technology is smart enough so that if they leave the office, for example, and they have some changes they've made, the client will be smart enough to back those changes up directly to the vault and skip the quick cache. And additionally, if someone has their files only on the quick cache and they don't have the chance to actually be uploaded to the vault itself, and then later on, for whatever reason, they need to pull those files down, the vault and quick cache are smart enough to communicate with one another see that the files only exist on the quick cache and prioritize that they're uploaded to the vault regardless of the schedule set to the quick cache. So that way the users are always able to get back their files as quickly as possible. Uh, another big component is the device migration. So Carbonite Endpoint will just back up the end user files, uh, user generated content, but on Windows devices, we're also able to work in conjunction with their user state migration tool that is built into Windows operating system. Um, what that will allow is that not only will you be able to back up the user generated files, but you can get some of their profiles and settings um, as well. So that when, if the user does need a new machine, not only are they getting their files, but they would be getting back their desktop and the orientation of all their icons, for example. A big piece about this is the centralized management and all of the advanced administrative controls we have to offer. So pretty much everything can be controlled centrally from within the dashboard. Um, and we do have some features like legal hold, which will prevent any data on a device from being deleted. Uh, that way, if someone is going through litigation and they do have to present data um, to, uh, you know, whether it's lawyers or whatever the situation may be, legal hold will ensure that the data is not able to be compromised and will be preserved in a state so that all of the evidence can be presented without any concerns of any items missing. And this entire process is invisible to end users. So if you know, there was a need to ensure that the end user doesn't know um, that you know, there is litigation or that potentially they're being investigated, legal hold will you know, make sure that you're meeting the requirements from a legal standpoint without tipping off the end user, so to speak. Uh, um, additionally, we have administrative restore, which kind of goes in with legal hold. You can restore information from a central location either with an API or going into that administrative dashboard uh, and managing that centrally, um, as well as other APIs we have that can help automate certain processes so that not everything necessarily needs to be done from within the dashboard. Another big component is all of the security functionality. So not only did I mention we have encryption keys um, and we encrypt every individual block of a file, which means they all have their own encryption keys, but we do use 256-bit AES encryption uh, and we have other features like location tracking um, or the ability to wipe files from the device itself. So the story usually told here is, I'll just use an example, someone goes to the airport and they come to you and say, I realized that I don't have my laptop and I left it in the airport. You can open up the map for their device and see where it was on that map from where it last phoned home. And if you see that it's, you know, 30 miles from the airport, for example, you might have some concerns that it's in the hands of someone malicious. So um, you know, even though you know the data is being backed up and secure with Carbonite, you might actually be concerned with that person getting their hands on the files themselves on the device. So there you can actually, 
um, trigger a remote wipe call. And what that will do is when the device phones home, it will automatically delete any of the files that have been protected by Carbonite Endpoint from the device itself. So the physical files that exist on the device, they will actually be removed so that they can't be uh, accessed by anyone who does have their hands on the device. Additionally, if you wanted to set that up to be time-based, um, instead of being a manual trigger, we'll just use 30 days for example, but you can configure the policy so that if the Carbonite agent is on, but realizes that it hasn't phoned home and you know, we'll use the 30 day example here, um, in 30 days, that will automatically trigger that remote wipe. And again, that's something that is controlled by policy. So you have the ability to go in and make sure that functionality is off if you don't want it, or change the amount of time um, that that automatic trigger can function if you did want to have it enabled. Um, but pretty much everything with regards to how the product functions can be controlled within the policy. And you can create as many policies as you want. Um, there's very granular settings such as, you know, the time, what end users can do, such as if they can restore files or if they can only restore files that belong to their user account. Um, the, the frequency of the backup and, and just pretty much every way that the product works and how the end users interact with it can be controlled within that policy. And something that we will be offering very soon is uh, support for Office 365 backup. So there are a lot of people that are moving to the cloud and are you know, using things such as OneDrive and SharePoint, but they're looking for a way to ensure that their information isn't only with Microsoft or in, in one location. So we will be um, offering a solution that will help support uh, backing up Office 365. And then the biggest piece of it is that it's very user friendly. So whether it's you know, as an administrator, uh, you yourself, or if you're gonna allow the end users to log into the dashboard or you know, uh, interact with the uh, client interface that's installed on their machines, um, it is very straightforward so that you don't necessarily need to read a, a user guide before you are able to uh, set the product up and use it confidently. Uh, so I won't go over all these, but some of the key technologies, so as I mentioned, the security um, with our levels of encryption, all of our data centers are SOC 2 Type 2 compliant. Um, one of the things that sometimes you hear from larger organizations or people that are very security concerned is wanting the ability to manage their encryption keys. So by default, the encryption keys are managed by Carbonite um, and they are hosted within the vaults in a secure manner. But if you or you had clients that wanted to manage the encryption keys themselves, um, we do have an offering that allows them to set up a server so that can act as the key controller. And that will basically be the only, where, uh, only location where the, the main encryption key is uh, libs. So if you know, any data does need to be accessed, it will have to contact that key controller to ensure that it does have access to pull those files down. Uh, I did talk about the quick cache. Uh, the main thing being it is a local component, so that way backups and restores can happen a lot faster, but it is optional, um, especially with our deduplication and the faster internet rates uh, over the past few years. Uh, there aren't a lot of people who really need it, but again, it is a free component, so if anyone does have any bandwidth concerns, this can really help mitigate any of those concerns. And then in general, just our global deduplication. So saving on bandwidth and storage, um, you know, by minimizing the amount of data that needs to be uploaded, if you were to deploy your own vault, it also drastically reduces the total data footprint that you will be storing uh, in your vault. And then on top of that, as I mentioned, each individual block is encrypted, which means they each have their own unique encryption key. So each block has an encryption key, then there are device encryption keys, and then there are company encryption keys. So there are multiple levels of encryption throughout the entire product to ensure that there's no way for anyone to get access to that information unless they're truly authorized to have access to the backups. So to kind of bring it all together, um, you know, just some of the things that people generally should be thinking about when talking about Carbonite Endpoint is the flexibility and scalability. So flexibility with regards to whether it's you know, using the Carbonite vaults or you deploying your own vault within your own Azure account or a customer's Azure account, for example, or uh, within your own infrastructure for an on-premise vault, um, that can work. S the scalability means that regardless of the size of an organization or how many you know, uh, devices are being backed up on a vault, all of the vault functionality can scale. So whether it starts with 10 users to eventually grow to 100,000, that isn't a problem um, because especially with an Azure, it is very easy for us to continuously update components needed to ensure that all users have a smooth experience with regards to backing up or with regards to management from the administrative console. 
And additionally, you can deploy it in a manner where everything is controlled centrally, where none of your clients or end users have to do anything, and it's all controlled centrally, or to the extreme end where you basically set up your clients so that they can act as administrators and have full functionality um, and control over their account and how the devices are working with regards to schedules and, and backups and things along those lines. But um, you don't have to be on the extremes, this is obviously in the middle, um, but pretty much regardless of what your client's needs are, we have options that can meet those needs and you can set up multiple options um, for individual clients or you know, multiple clients. Security, so regardless of uh, the level of encryption we're using, we also have the block level encryption as I mentioned, we have some of those features such as remote wipe and device tracking that can really help in a situation where if, you know, the, the device is lost or stolen. Um, so multiple levels of security that you should keep in mind for the product because nowadays security is a big concern for people, especially with corporate data. And then just in general, it's smart technology. So whether it's the quick cash and vault communicating with each other to figure out the best, best path forward with regards to backing up or restoring, uh, it's our deduplication algorithm to uh, limit the amount of bandwidth that's needed um, or the various other offerings such as the policy controls to really ensure that the product is working exactly as you need it to or ensuring that it's meeting the needs of your clients. So just to look at the offering, um, it is a solution that you do purchase by seat. So we have a couple plans where um, you can purchase 100 gigabytes per seat or unlimited storage per seat. Um, with that, you can do it whether it's monthly or prepay. And if you do the prepay for one or three years, um, you do get a discount when you do a three year pre uh, prepay. So for the actual deployment options, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is the Carbonite hosted vault. And when you're using one of the Carbonite hosted vaults, that's where you would be paying either for the 100 gigabyte or the unlimited um, storage per seat. Then the other options are when you're using your own uh, vault within Carbonite, I'm sorry, when you're using your own Azure EA to deploy a vault, or if you have your own infrastructure to deploy an on-premise vault, that is where you would only be paying for the software. There's no limit on storage because you will be the one providing the storage, again, whether it's locally in your own infrastructure or within Azure. So all we will be doing is charging for the storage. Um, and then coming soon, as I, I alluded to a little earlier, we have the Carbonite Endpoint 360, which is going to include support for backing up Office 365 to the Carbonite Cloud. And then just some additional uh, things to keep in mind is, uh, depending on how you wanna move forward, there are things that do require professional services. So if you did wanna deploy your own vault for yourself or one of your clients, that will require professional services to be involved. Um, the product can be white labeled. So if you did wanna change the branding from Carbonite to you know, the name of your company, that is possible, but it does require uh, professional services as well. Uh, and then there are just a few other things, such as if you wanted to work with our professional services team to create some custom reporting or help with a very large deployment um, or various other situations, um, they can get involved there as well. And uh, I won't go right through every single detail, but typically when, uh, when, when talking about Carbonite Endpoint, uh, we hear about some of our competitors, and the, the main ones are, in my opinion, are Code42 and Druva. Um, so, so the biggest wins for Carbonite for both of them is our client-side deduplication. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned, we don't actually have to upload unnecessary blocks or files to the vault to then realize we don't need it. We're able to optimize that whole workflow by deduplicating on the device that has the Carbonite uh, client installed on it without impacting the end user's machine, you know, whether the, keeping, you know, the, the performance from being impacted or their bandwidth from being impacted. Uh, we also have a really strong relationship with Microsoft um, since our vaults are all within Azure and Azure has some really great SLAs. Our relationship does help ensure that as they make changes and update, um, we're keeping and staying ahead of the game to keep things optimized. Um, I talked about our encryption of the blocks and our files in general. We never decrypt any of the backup unless it is actually being restored. Um, some of our competitors do have situations where some of the files will be unencrypted in their cloud. Um, another big piece I do want to mention is the local cache. So this is different from the quick cache, where the quick cache is something you would set up for multiple devices to back up to first, with, and then the quick cache would upload to the vault. The local cache is actually something that the, when you install Carbonite Endpoint on a machine, by default, we will reserve five gigabytes of storage space, and this is the local cache. And what this does is it ensures that regardless of you know, the internet connection, 
maybe the, the user doesn't have an internet connection, maybe they're on the plane and didn't pay for the Wi-Fi, their backups will still occur because they will always be first sent to that local cache. Then once they have an internet connection, everything in the local cache will be uploaded and the user will also be able to restore the individual history of their files. One of the nice things about this is, because, is that typically when someone's restoring you know, one or two files, it's something they were recently worked, uh, working on as opposed to when, you know, if they need to get their entire machine back, you know, that, that can be a longer process. But when they're restoring one or two files and, and, or a group of files and it's something they recently worked on, there's a sh very high probability that the blocks for those files will be on the local cache. And what that means is when the restore request is submitted, it won't actually need to download anything from the internet because the backups will actually already exist on the machine. So that, that really ensures that, you know, those files are able to be restored as quickly as possible, um, you know, sometimes within a few seconds, depending on the size of the file, because they don't actually need to rely on any outward connection to the internet. Um, and then another piece is the incremental restore functionality we have. Um, this is something we offered, uh, we recently released, where if you, you're doing multiple restores to a device, um, let's just say a user is getting a new machine, so you back up their first device, and after the first device is backed up, you're gonna now restore all their information to their new machine. Well, once you've restored all their new information, all their information to the new machine, um, there could be a period of time where that restore is completed, but the user has still been making changes on their original device. What the incremental restore functionality will allow you to do is from the administrative console, trigger a restore of their backup, and it will look at files that already exist on the machine, so they could be there from your initial restore. And if the file is already on the machine, it will compare the local copy of the file to the copy that is backed up in the vault. And if the version in the vault is a newer version of the file, then it will be restored, otherwise we'll skip it. And that really ensures that the machine could be in its most recent state with regards to the files having the most up-to-date changes without having to do a, a long restore and minimizing the total amount of, you know, potentially the end user's bandwidth if they're at home, for example, that would be needed to complete the restore. Um, and similar to uh, some of the things that Carl was mentioning, is just recurring revenue is pretty important. So um, Carbonite Endpoint does allow for it. Uh, we do have an example here. These aren't the actual numbers, but it's just more to kind of provide a visual of you know, how you can work, uh, use Carbonite Endpoint to provide some recurring revenue uh, for your business. Um, and by having recurring, recurring revenue, it obviously makes things more predictable and allows you to, to plan for growth. So... With that, um, we're going to talk about partnering with Carbonite, and I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Hickox, and I'm a part of the channel marketing team here at Carbonite. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes of your time at the end here to run through some of the benefits you could get from partnering with Carbonite, uh, mostly from the perspective of our partner program. So just sort of starting up top, we are a channel focused company and the whole internal teams are set up that way. We have dedicated experts, sales, pre-sales, marketing resources here to help our partners sort of at any phase of the sales cycle, um, just here to support you and close deals quickly. Uh, as a piece of that, we have strong marketing capabilities for our partners. We actually have a couple different partner focused marketing teams. Um, they're here to help Carbonite align Carbonite resources with your go to market plans, uh, co branding, um, and all different sort of types of tiers depending on what level of partnership you're at with us. We have a unified partner portal. So in here, you can manage all of your customers, no matter which products you're selling. Um, they're all in one hub. There's also free sales, marketing, and training materials in this portal, and you can either sort of walk through those with Carbonite experts, or it is very self-service as well, sort of depending on your business model and the way that you like to do things. We give you access to instructor-led trainings on industry topics, so sort of expanding your knowledge about the data protection industry and uh, top of mind thought leadership beyond just Carbonite portfolio stuff. We offer NFR licenses to demo our products, as well as free trials for your customers. So making sure everyone sort of knows what they're getting from all ends of the spectrum. 
Uh, and like I briefly mentioned, our program is tiered. So, you know, the more you work with us, the more we want to work with you and help support that relationship. Um, and that's considered being a premier partner. Uh, some of those additional benefits could include early access to beta testing Carbonite products before general release to the public, um, initiative-based MDF, our marketing development funds, so sort of extra support for any marketing you might already be doing with us, um, as well as invitations to partner conferences, different partner councils, advisory boards, and sponsorship from one of the Carbonite executives. So that's sort of just a really high level glance of some of the more exciting parts of our partner program, um, in addition to our strong portfolio, of which Endpoint is obviously a big piece of that, but we have a bunch of other data protection products as well. So we always are open to having new partnership discussions and we hope you'll reach out to us if you have any interest in learning more. All right, hey, thank you very much, Emily and Jonathan. This is Michael Siggins again. So a uh, lot of great information, uh, first with Carl and then the team at Carbonite. I just wanna remind folks that we would love to have Thank you very much. There's already questions coming in. Uh, down in the in lower kind of center part of your browser window, you should see a Q&A box. Please uh, send questions in there. <clears throat> All right, so without any further ado, let's get into some of these questions. Um, okay, so uh, first couple coming in for, uh, for the Carbonite specifically. What's the process to back up Office 365? Jonathan, I wonder if you want to take that one. Sorry, uh, I was having a hard time unmuting. Um, so that's a great question. Um, so as of right now, the Office 365 backup solution I mentioned is not available, um, but it will be uh, something that will be coming fairly shortly. Uh, that will be a separate product, so it's not something that you'll, you won't be able to just use the Carbonate Endpoint solution to back up Office 365 components. This will be a, a separate uh, offering that will also be bundled with the Endpoint solution um, that will have its own interface and portal to make sure that uh, you know, you're able to configure it to back up you know, whatever component it is within Office 365. Excellent, excellent. Okay, next up, can you describe the options for getting files back for users? All right, that's a great question. So um, there are a few options, and it, it, uh, the one I'll mention first is that within the, the agent or the client that's installed on the end user's machine, uh, there is a restore tab so depending on how it's deployed, whether you know, there, it's you or there's an admin for one of your clients that is managing it, um, if you allow end users to actually see the interface and the policy is set to grant them permissions, end users can go into the, the, the UI themselves and select their files that need to be restored back to their machine. Uh, the other option is we have the web access component where you can go to the website uh, and download a few individual files at a time. Um, but the more popular component is our administrative restore functionality. So centrally from within the dashboard or using some of our APIs, um, you can make a request to restore the backup from a device to any device that is within that organization. Um, so again, you can go in the dashboard and just choose the device that you want to restore, the point in time you want to restore from, and then which device you want it to go to. It could be back to the original or any device that does belong to that organization. So there are a few different options, whether it's the end user doing it themselves or using our APIs or the portal as an administrator to, put, to initiate the restore. Okay, and kind of related to that, you mentioned any device. Uh, another question, is endpoint compatible with mobile devices? So we do have some um, uh, mobile applications uh, that allow you to actually view your backups. So end users can install to view their backups themselves. There is a backup piece to it, so that would back up some of the contacts, the videos, and pictures. It doesn't have the functionality to back up like any user-generated documents or anything like that. Okay, uh, next up, let's see, got a couple questions, okay. Um, another question about signing up to become a partner. Uh, I was wondering, Jonathan, do you know if uh, one of Emily's slides had that information on it. I know she, she did an overview of the partner program. Was there uh, a link or anything on there? Or should we just say to folks that we're going to send that information in the follow-up? Hi, uh, I can jump in here. Uh, we will have a follow-up where you can reach out to partners at carbonite.com. 
Um, so that'll be in the follow-up email. If you want to write it down, it's just partners, plural, at carbonite.com, and we can help you out there. Or if you go to our main website, carbonite.com, there is an application. If you scroll to the bottom, you can reach out that way, fill out some of the basic information, and someone will be in touch with you that way as well. Excellent. We also put it into the chat box there, Emily, too, for you. Okay, <clears throat> okay the next question is uh, kind of, Carl, this is your alert here, is kind of a sort of a dual question. Um, someone's asking about, um, about pricing your services in a way where they can, they can maximize profit and recurring revenue. And I'm going to kind of spin that a little bit because uh, I know that Carl is a big advocate of sort of bundling services uh, but for certain reasons. And I want him to get into that. But maybe, Jonathan, if we can start with you first. Do you or does your partner program say, you know, offer guidance on pricing or do you just want, you know, your customers to sort of seek out the thing that works best for them in their market and et cetera? So th there isn't necessarily any, any, any set guidelines, but we do offer some support in terms of, you know, if they were curious about, you know, what you could price our solutions at or other ways to potentially bundle it. Um, we, we do have areas where we can offer some guidance um, and, you know, I guess best practices, um, but there's, there's no set, um, you know, like documentation around that, if that makes sense. Yep, doesn't. And then Carl, I believe I've heard you once and once or twice mention the importance of sort of bundling, like it, for very strategic reasons. Could you? Talk yeah, I think that? bundling is the greatest way to not only the greatest way to make money, but it's the greatest way to differentiate yourself and to um, basically create something where the client gets guaranteed value, right? Because uh, a a Backup or emergency restore system in isolation has a certain value. But when you combine it with what you do every month to provide, you know, patch management or even Office 365, when you put that bundle together, you can create something that, you know, the goal is to give clients all the technology they need in one bundle. And then the, the cost of each component becomes less relevant because basically you're pricing it on the value of the, the top line, right? What's the value of having all the data I need and having all the storage and all the antivirus and spam filtering and, you know, everything in one bundle, including um, the emergency repair, that is something that has a very high value. And so, you know, saying, you know, X percent or, or whatever markup becomes almost irrelevant to the discussion because you're bundling based on the value the client is getting and that's a much bigger number than selling each of the little components separately. So I, I think it's huge to uh, put it in the bundle and, you know, you know, if Carbonite would argue, make Carbonite the, the, uh, the backup of choice, right? So uh, that's, that's just an easy thing that you can do, but I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't sell almost any service separately. I would always bundle it. Okay. <clears throat> and then Carl, if I can ask you maybe to expound upon it a little bit, uh, you know, your, we talked about the importance of recurring revenue, right? Which is this most wonderful sort of model. But um, I know you've got some specific thinking too about not only is it just great to, you know, you sell that uh, recurring revenue plan to your customer, but you've got some advice, I'm sure, about, you know, um, when you look at sort of terms, like say a, a contract for whatever, six, 12 months, whatever, how that might renew uh, in the best interest of our audience today and maybe even price increases and things like that built into it. Can you speak to us a little bit about that sort of taking bundling a, a step beyond and how to maximize the profits on an ongoing basis? Right. Well, so first you create the bundle and then I'm a big fan of selling it with certain minimums. For example, um, I love the idea of having a five pack of licenses so that, you know, if somebody's got seven users, they buy two five packs and that way they can grow a little bit and it won't cost them any extra money. You get uh, the, the money from, you know, basically 10 users, even though you're supplying services to seven users. So that's a way that you can add a little extra margin in there. I think contracts should be automatically renewing. So basically, uh, you know, and I've got a book on contracts, obviously, but, you know, one of the things that we say in there is, 
you know, make your contracts so that they automatically redo, renew, whether it's 30 days or 12 months or three years. Um, and of course, I think that everybody should raise their prices all the time, but <laughs> maybe once a year is probably more reasonable. Uh, but, you know, put that in there. It just automatically just happens. And, you know, I think a lot of people are afraid of these things. They're afraid of asking somebody to sign a contract. Some of them are afraid of asking for more money and some of them are afraid of bundling. And I would just encourage you to step back and think about whether what you're doing is, uh, are you motivated by the fear that somebody's going to leave you or are you motivated by the opportunity to give them a higher level of service for a longer period of time? And, you know, that comes with a price, you know? So I just think a lot of people need to, to think a little bit bigger about the money side of things and not be worried that all their clients are going to leave them if they charge a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. Great, great stuff. Great stuff. Jonathan, we're going to um, <clears throat> go back to you. Uh, another question. Uh, can users or devices be imported in bulk? Yes. So um, we have a couple ways. There's the ability to download a CSV file um, and you can input all the information and have, and then import that in. So it will already provision the user accounts. And if you want to provide the device names, it can, you would still need to actually deploy the agent or within that bulk import, depending on how you want to manage it, configure the users to actually install on their own. So um, if you did use the bulk import, one of the settings would be to also send an email to those users. So that way, after all the users are added and their devices are added, they also get an email with instructions to download. If you don't want to do that, you don't have to. You can still bulk import the users and then centrally deploy the agent and it will automatically activate against the devices that have already been, been imported with that initial uh, uh, Excel or CSV file import. Okay, sounds good. And then we have actually got a, a number of questions about um, <clears throat> asking if the recording's available, more information. Yet, just a quick reminder that yes, we will be following up with everybody with additional information, including link to the recording, uh, also to the, uh, the, the slides uh, for your review later or to pass on to someone on your, on your team, as well as contact information that we mentioned for the partner programs and also Carl's information too. Um, all right, so again, want to encourage folks to send in any questions in the Q&A. And uh, now I'm going to kind of, I want to go back to Carl, maybe for kind of some wrap-up thoughts today when you think about the overall topic here and how recurring revenue is king and maximizing profits. Uh, anything else you feel would be good for our audience to take away with them today? Uh, well, so it's interesting. So one of the comments Eric made is that no customer thinks that a price increase is irrelevant. But I got to tell you, no customer is going to leave you over five dollars uh, unless you are already on the border of losing that customer. <laughs> so I encourage people to really, you know, think about if you went to your customers and said, "Look, here's what you need to do. This is the right way of providing uh, tech support in the 21st century. We're going to have a bundle, and we're going to provide you with all the technology you need. That includes." The, you know, obviously the storage and includes the backup and includes your office bundle, all that kind of stuff. We're going to give it all to you. And here's the thing that a lot of people miss in this business. Your customer doesn't want to have seven or eight relationships, which is the norm in cloud services, right? When you think about, oh, I've got office over here and then I've got, you know, the the antivirus and the spam filtering and the remote monitoring, patch management, da 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 all these things, clients don't want to do that. They want to have one point of contact. And so you need to choose the best in business, right? The best uh, tools and services that you can, bundle those together, and then sell them at a reasonable price. You know, what I consider to be a premium, somebody else might consider to be cheap. So. You know, you got to figure out for your market and your bundle what's the right price, but absolutely put together a bundle and take it to your clients and say, this is the future of what we're doing with technology. And we're always going to be on the top of it. We're always going to provide you with the absolute best uh, service. And that includes, you know, making sure that we're here and that you never lose your data. Amen to that. All right, Jonathan, any uh, parting advice for us today? Uh, just emphasizing how critical it is for your customers to make sure that their environment is protected. Um, we, we were talking a lot about endpoints today. 
one of the biggest things I usually hear from people is that they don't believe that they need to protect the endpoints because it's all on the server or something along those lines. But a lot of times that requires some user action and it's not always automated. And when there's user interaction required, that means there's an opportunity for a mistake. Um, so even if it's just to show the value, as Carl was mentioning, just showing the value, even if it's to, to start with just protecting the most critical devices within that organization and then showing the information like how big the backups are, but um, and emphasizing how important it is to make sure there's a plan in place and then showing the value. And again, you have various options of doing that with you know, small deployment or trial, um, but those, are, those will be the critical things I would, would leave with today. Excellent. All right. Hey, Jonathan Ferrick, Product Manager at Carbonate. Thank you very, very much for uh, presenting all this great information today and making the webinar possible. Appreciate you being here. And Carl Palachuk, great to see you again. Um, Carl, again, is a big part of, sort of the, the Channel Pro network and a lot of what we do. And we, we really love being able to partner with uh, Carl because he brings such great real world insights to everybody. And his goal is to make you more successful. And I know uh, that Channel Pro, and I'm sure Carbonite shares that uh, kind of mission too. We're here to help you and we're here to partner with you. Uh, this is Michael Siggins, and on behalf of everybody here at the Channel Pro team, I want to thank you so much for being here today. And again, we will be sending out information after the event with uh, links and follow-up and all the good data and slides. All right. Hey, Carl, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Jonathan, thanks again to you and your team. Thank you very much. All right. That's it, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye now.